Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Al Hewer. I am uh, Terry Shenfield's partner in a t Lectures. I am a professor at Rutgers University. I'm also a adjunct professor at the respiratory care programs at Rush University in Chicago, Rowan University in South Central New Jersey, and County College of Morris in Northwestern New Jersey. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And in this lecture, I'm going to be covering ARDSNET. So ARDSNET is a, if you will, network of guidelines that has, uh, you know, provides clinicians, doctors, respiratory therapists, etc., with guidance on how to um, ventilate patients who are, are at risk for ac acute respiratory distress syndrome or individuals that actually have it in order, in order to manage their oxygenation and ventilation. So uh, over the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to be covering some of the foundational, if you will, elements of ARDSNET and some of the newer developments that relate to it as well. So again, thanks for joining us and hopefully you enjoy this lecture. Some of the learning objectives that we'll be, we'll be focusing on include reviewing the hazards of mechanical ventilation. So I have a, uh, a, a colleague, actually Terry and I had a colleague at University Hospital in beautiful Newark, New Jersey, who used to call ventilators death machines. Now he was saying that tongue in cheek. He knew that they could actually save lives, that artificial airways and mechanical ventilation can save lives. Um, but he basically also knew that if patients stay on them long enough, it's a route for infection, that positive pressure breathing is not natural. Um, it's actually completely opposite that, and that yeah, being on a ventilator long enough can cause harm. So we'll view the hazards of mechanical ventilation. Describe the evolution of ARDSNET. Examine key aspects of ARDSNET. Describe how ARDSNET can and has been applied at the bedside. Examine adjunctive therapies, which can be combined with the ARDSNET strategies. Review some of the cases and questions in ARDSNET in order to illustrate some of these concepts in action. Describe where more work probably needs to be done. And like we do with essentially all of our presentations, to furnish you with additional resources should you want to drill down and learn more about this topic. Let's get started. So just to build on the initial theme that I was referring to a little bit earlier on, um, again, the doctor that, that uh, was very, very uh, respiratory friendly. Um, he was one of the intensivists in the medical ICU unit at uh, University Hospital, again, in Newark, New Jersey. And again, he basically was very, uh, he was ahead of his time. So this was 35 years ago, and he was, he wasn't, again, he was pro-ventilator, he was pro-respiratory uh, care, but at the same time, he knew that um, the longer that patients stay on ventilators, the worse off it is. Um, and if they need to be on ventilators, there, you know, he sensed that there was particular strategies that at that time we weren't necessarily using, but uh, we now know can, you know, enhance outcomes and can minimize, again, those iatrogenic, those hospital caused or healthcare provider caused uh, injuries and problems, health problems. So if you really think about it, um, it's not just the mechanical ventilators, but you think about all the things that go along with it, the airway issues. So initially, you know, yes, you can, you know, we can, you know, ventilate patients non-invasively, but the main focus of ARDSNET is not on that. It is on invasive ventilation. So they have an artificial airway. Initially, it's almost universally an endotracheal tube that goes through the vocal cord. So patients are prone to vocal cord injury. Microaspiration can be an issue. Indeed, the subglottic uh, endotracheal tubes can minimize that, but it's still a risk. Biofilm, we know that biofilm can start building up in the inside of an endotracheal tube very, very soon. Um, and as that, you know, the, the, the microbes that are in that biofilm are not necessarily the same microbes, if there are any, that are down in the, in the, the, the natural airway and in the lungs. So, you know, that's just a few of them. The actual act of intubating can be traumatic in and of itself. And then you have the issues of ventilator associated pneumonias. So patients that, you know, perhaps because they aspirate, perhaps because we don't use good clean or sterile technique, um, you know, we don't do good mouth care, we don't head, you know, raise the head of the bed, et cetera, the whole montage of things that are within the VAP prevention bundle, 
patients are still at risk for that as well. Maybe we over distend the lung um, and we, we, we overstretch it, causing an inflammatory cascade, um, you know, worsening their condition and you know, contributing further to a ventilator associated pneumonia. And then you have other infection related issues. So you have patients that are you know, heavily sedated, in some cases heavily sedated and paralyzed around mechanical ventilation. And therefore they're at risk for developing you know, things like hemodynamic instability, for developing infections, for developing bed sores, um, de developing DVTs that could migrate up you know, to, to the pulmonary uh, artery, which is really a vein and cause a PE or a stroke, et cetera. So you think about their, you know, the patient's stasis, they're, they're not moving around um, at least until they're ready to, you know, we're waking them up, et cetera. The, um, the normal mechanics of breathing are reversed. So you get patients who, you know, normal negative pressure gradient between the airway and the, and the, the alveoli is disturbed. So you're really, you know, creating a gradient by creating positive pressure at the airway. Not, it's not, uh, it's something above atmospheric. There's nothing natural about that. And then volume and pressure concerns, we're gonna talk about things like shearing pressures and over distension, which you know, is really closely targeted by the whole ARDSNET philosophy. In, in some ventilators can be you know, very, very dangerous, particularly over a, a, a protracted period of time. Again, the whole philosophy of ARDSNET is to reduce those dangers. I would say eliminate, I don't know if it's possible to eliminate them, but to certainly reduce those dangers. So the origins of Ardnet, Ardsnet are, um, they're intriguing to me at least, and they may, they may be to you as well. So there is a article published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2000 from a study that, uh, where they looked at, um, you know, basically giving patients tidal volumes of 12 mLs per kg, which was kind of the, the standard, 10 to 12, you know, was kind of the standard then to an experimental group of half that, six mLs per kg. And um, they actually, they enrolled a total of 861 patients or subjects. Um, and what they were doing though, was they were looking at the, the difference in all cause mortality and things like length of stay, things along those lines. And they found out um, after they had enrolled these 681 subjects, that the 28 day mortality for the higher tidal volume group was almost 40%, 39.8, versus the lower tidal volume group that had a mortality rate of 31%. And this, this p-value uh, figure that's noted in this slide, p-value is just the likelihood that these results were by chance. And the accepted, if you will, largest p-value is 0 0.05, 0 0.05 which would mean that there's a 5% chance that these results are by chance. Well, the, the, the p-value in this case was 0 0.007, okay? So it was, if you will, seven chances in a thousand, not seven chances in a hundred, seven chances in a thousand, that this result was due to chance. So basically saying that, that the um, results were very um, reliable, if you will. Um, so you have somebody such as, me, I'm about, I'm just under 5'10". Um, my ideal or predicted body weight is probably, you know, 75 to 80 kgs. Um, so for six mLs per kg, it would be a tidal volume of about 450 versus a tidal volume that could well have been in the sevens, you know, up to eight, you know, but well, well, you know, well above that. Um, so we've really come a long way in that the tidal volumes we give to our patients, even ones who do not have ARDS, in order to reduce the likelihood that they'll develop it from being on the ventilator uh, uh, too long. So this was a hallmark study and it really it represented the first inroad to what would eventually become ARDSNET. There have been many, many uh, subsequent studies that have been done that by and large support those results. I will say the one caveat is that um, we also know that with low tidal volumes or very low tidal volumes of four to six mLs per kg, there is also a higher likelihood of atelectasis. So in, in patients who can tolerate therapeutic PEEP, we combine these low tidal volumes in many cases with PEEPs of eight, 10, 12, again, if they can tolerate it. 
But the additional studies that have really supported the original one that was published in 2000, so you have Hodgson um, and others where, you know, they looked at permissive hypercapnia, alveolar recruitment, you know, low airway pressures, uh, protocol for phase two trial in patients with acute respiratory distress. And it really, in, in the end, so it was published in 2018, so, you know, a full 18 years uh, after that, that initial study, it really supported the, those results. There's, a, there's many, many other studies um, in between 2000 and 2018 that supported it. I also included this other study here where um, Kermani and others, uh, they looked at, you know, positive expiratory uh, and expiratory pressure lower than ARDS neck is associated with higher pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome mortality. So that was looking at a very, very specific patient pop population of pediatrics. But by and large, but by and large, what they have found is that the, um, the results of the ARDSnet, the initial trials were pretty much supported by subsequent ones. The four main tenets or fundamental principles of ARDSnet are lower tidal volumes, again, six mLs per kg, potentially as low as four mLs per kg, liberal use of PEEP or more liberal than many clinicians are accustomed to, keeping plateau pressures less than or equal to 30, but even preferably less than or equal to 25. Now, when we had you know, the, the initial onslaughts of, um, of COVID-19, in, in some of those cases, it was really not possible to keep the plateaus, uh, you know, at le you know, equal to or less than 30, the goal was still try to, to try to get as close. So if we were in the 30s, if we were in the upper 30s and middle 30s, to try to get those those figures down to the lower 30s, as close to 30 or less as possible, by using things like you know low, low tidal volumes, even offloading, you know, some of the pressure by doing like reverse Trendelenburg. You know, perhaps using, you know, PRVC instead of just regular assist control, um, you know, you know, th th things along those lines. Um, and if you were just using regular assist control, maybe deliver the breath more slowly to, in order to try to not slam the breath in there. Maybe you gain, you know, a point or so or maybe two on your plateau and your peak pressure as well. And keeping driving pressures less than 15 centimeters of water. Driving pressure, just for, for the sake of review, is the difference between plateau and PEEP. And again, I'm reiterating, but it's not equal to or less than 15, it's less than 15. Because we know the science, the studies have really pointed to driving pressures of 15 or more, okay, or plateau pressures of greater than 30 are associated with a higher risk of, if you will, iatrogenic, ARDS or just iatrogenic lung injury. So I'm not going to read this the whole slide to you, but basically what this this is talking about is kind of a stepwise fashion of a ventilator setup per ARDSnet. Okay, so calculating predicted body weight. Thankfully, um, with a lot of these electronic health records, including Epic, if you put in the patient's height, it will calculate that for you. A lot of the templates will even calculate what the tidal volume would be at, let's say, 10, 8, 6 and sometimes even four mLs per kg. So getting that in there. Selecting um, any ventilator mode, by the way, ARDSnet also likes pressure control ventilation. So it's not just dual mode, you know, PRVC, it's not just assist control, but they're not, they're not biased at all against pressure control. Set the mandatory rate, you know, less than 35, probably less than 30 to 28. Um, if you have, you know, with all else constant, if you increase that respiratory rate too much, you're probably gonna get some auto peeping. There's not enough time for the patient to exhale, so they'll, they'll if you will, be breath stacking. Target a SBO2 of 88 to 95. So there's, there's a saying, you know, 55 keeps them alive. So not that you want the patient to live with a PaO2 of 55, but a SAT of about 88 corresponds crudely to a PO2 of about 55. So they're basically saying, keep that, you know, keep 55 to 80, you know, some of the guidance will say 85 or 90, but certainly, you know, in that range. And accepting, PAO2s of even like in the 60s for longer periods of time, particularly if those PO2s are starting to, to uh, you know, to improve. So for instance, the P to F ratio is starting to improve. So you're more apt to tolerate, you know, these numbers that are not the desired end result, but that they're tolerable. Increasing the PEEP in a stepwise fashion. So, you know, some of the slides that I'll show you right out of ARDSnet, they really talk about very liberal use of PEEP. Um, again, being careful of hemodynamic monitoring, et cetera. 
Um, the aim, again, plateau pressures of uh, equal to less than 30. Um, and again, if the plateau pressure is greater than 30, allow, you know, basically in a stepwise fashion, gradual fashion, go down to as low of a, of a tidal volume as uh, 4 mLs per kg. Um, also permissive hypercapnia. So you may tolerate pHs. Yeah, Arginet will say, you know, um, you know, up to about 7.15, 7.20. A lot of the physicians will get really twitchy at that level, but the point of it is they will tolerate some moderate respiratory acidosis in exchange for those low, lower tidal volumes, particularly if the patient is, um, is starting to, um, they're, 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 they're starting to improve and their, 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 their kidneys are starting to retain hydrogen ions. And then increasing, you know, you could actually increase the tidal volume up to about 8 mLs per kg. But again, we're, we're, we're tolerating PO2s, you know, 55 to 65. We're tolerating PCO2s that, that may result in pHs of 7.25, um, not as an end result, but, but in order to minimize injury to the, to the lungs. So this is an excerpt out of ARDSnet. So if you guys are wondering, well, how do I find ARDSnet? You can actually put ARDSnet in a Google search box and you'll, you'll get this. You can also go to the, directly to the National Institutes of Health, put in ARDSnet and you'll, you know, you'll get uh, basically led to the site that has a lot of uh, useful tools, a lot of these studies that support it as well. So one of the useful tools that, that you would find there would be this, uh, you know, these tables, this slide, but these tables. Um, and they actually talk, if, you, if you'll notice, they talk about, um, so the two higher tables talk about lower PEEP, higher FiO2. The bottom two talk about higher PEEP, lower FiO2. But if you just notice on the bottom portion, they talk about higher PEEP, they will actually recommend as long as the patient's not uh, doesn't have bullous disease, it's not hemodynamically compromised, they are recommending the use of even 8, 10, and 12 of PEEP on 30% oxygen. Okay, that's extreme. We're not kind of accustomed to that. But if you do it in a stepwise fashion, starting at 5 to 8 of PEEP, and then going up in increments of 2, uh, while you're monitoring things like blood pressure, cardiac output, um, you know, patient status, etc., um, they, they really, they purport liberal use of PEEP, responsible but liberal use of PEEP. So this really ties into lower tidal volume, more liberal use of PEEP to try to combat any side effects of atelectasis. So it's one of the, one of the tenets of, um, of ARDSnet, as I said earlier, is more liberal but, again, responsible and informed use of PEEP. Building on the, that prior theme, you can actually use a pressure volume curve to also help inform the use of PEEP. And you're looking at the lower inflection point, okay, the LIP, lower inflection point. The upper one is known as the upper deflection point. And where you actually have a continuation of that wave, it's the beak, it's the over distension, which you do not want. But using the, um, the pressure volume curve to inform PEEP, typically what you're doing is you would set PEEP at one to two centimeters of pressure above above the lower inflection point. Again, monitoring the patient's hemodynamic status, blood pressure, cardiac output, um, their overall clinical status, and et cetera, et cetera. But again, you have some tools at your disposal to actually set PEEP in a, in a manner that is uh, tolerable by the patient, but also is helping the patient not de-recruit in between, in between each breath. So let's circle back to the plateau pressures and static compliance. And just you know, by way of review, we're getting a plateau pressure by doing an inspiratory pause, by doing an inspiratory pause. I mentioned earlier the goal is to maintain a plateau pressure less than or equal to 30, preferably less than or equal to 25. We're saying, we're saying this because that plateau pressure is implicated as a contributor to ventilator-induced lung injury or villi. It is, think of it, the villain with the villi, think of that sort of thing, but it is measured by performing, again, an inspiratory pause. It is also used to calculate static compliance. It's called static compliance, think about it, because it's a breath hold, it's an inspiratory pause, okay? Whereas dynamic compliance, you know, would be your peak pressure, okay? Your static compliance does not include that resistance component. Um, it just includes, if you will, the stiffness or, you know, the elastance or lack thereof of the lung. And I just you know, put the, the calculation there real fast for calculating 
um, static compliance, um, you know, of the long, you know, tidal volume over plateau minus P. Normal, and again, the books do vary a little bit. Normal um, uh, a static compliance is 50 to 100. I've seen some books even talk about 40 to 80, but it's, you know, it's, it's pretty high up there. It's unusual for us to get, you know, compliance unless the patient has a disease like emphysema where you lose elastins. It's unusual on a mechanically ventilated patient to get your, your static compliance much higher than, you know, 40 or 50. So what we're talking about in citing these normal values is what, you know, spontaneously breathing patients with otherwise healthy lungs. So now it begs the question, what do you, what happens, what, what kind of tools do you have at your disposal if the uh, plateau pressures are elevated? Okay, so that's where the lower tidal volume, doing it in a stepwise fashion, usually like one ml per kg at a time, reduce the tidal volume, you know, in volume ventilation or peak inspiratory pressure if it's pressure control ventilation. So that would be your delta P in pressure control ventilation. And again, per ARDSnet, plateau pressure greater than 30, decrease the tidal volume by increments of one ml per kg uh, steps going down to uh, you know, a low end of four mLs per kg. You can also do little tweaky changes. You can uh, increase inspiratory time or reduce the flow if it's uh, you know, regular uh, assist control volume control. You can also address any air trapping issues. So one of the things you, know, you look at is, well, if you're you know, setting the rate too high, um, that may rob time from expiratory time and leave the patient at risk for um, for you know auto peeping, for intrinsic peeping. Also, there's physiologic conditions such as bronchoconstriction, excessive secretions, which can do that as well. So you want to try to address those air trapping issues, um, which can be helpful uh, in addition. Again, we talked about you know driving pressure, but you know it's it's something that since COVID, you know, we're, that, that the population of of physicians, non-pulmonary physicians, and respiratory therapists much more conversant on this. But it's a difference between plateau uh, pressure and PEEP. Um, current suggestions, again, less than um, 15 uh, sonometers of, uh, of driving pressure is what's targeted. The management strategies essentially are similar, are similar to what you would have in managing your static compliance and your plateaus. The exception is, the exception is there's times where increases in PEEP, so incremental increases in PEEP, result in lung recruitment without increasing driving pressure, without increasing driving pressure. So you think about Boyle's law, okay? So you're, you're, you've increased PEEP, but if that PEEP is going into a, a greater volume, because you, you've actually, the PEEP is actually recruited out of the OLI, is the pressure, particularly again, your driving pressures, your plateau pressures may not increase concomitantly. And that might be seen in improvement in oxygenation, improvement in chest x-ray and things along those lines. Now let's build on this concept of ARDSnet by looking at some of the adjuncts okay, that we have out there. So this is where some of the, I don't wanna say new, but some of the newer research really comes into play. So, you know, it used to be when I came into practice 30 years ago, some of my colleagues would say, oh, you know, job security is, you know, don't ext ext extubate the patient because the longer around the ventilator, it's job security. That's, that's no longer the case, okay, just to be clear on that. And I don't mean any, I'm not implying any of you actually thought that. But, you know, today the, the mindset is, you know, the patient should be, they should be weaning unless, unless they prove otherwise. They should be off the vent unless they prove otherwise. So avoiding delays in weaning and ext extubating. So by doing daily spontaneous breathing trials, sometimes even more than just daily. If the reason they failed in the morning is too much sedation, lighten the sedation, get them, you know, a spontaneous awakening trial and try to at least get them weaning if not extubated. Prone positioning. So um, the, the evidence came out in 2016. So it preceded um, COVID-19 uh, that there was, there was some um, meta-analysis. So meta-analysis is just a study where they take, they combine the results of several well-done studies. And um, they found, it, it, it published 2016, that if you're proning these patients early, so early, you know, within 48 hours after the apparent onset of um, you know, of ARDS um, and leaving them prone as tolerated a minimum of 12 hours goes a long way. So that's another adjunct. Other forms of positioning, you know, good lung down and unilateral disease, that's to really kind of allow the, the, the uh, if you will, gravity to work in our betterment. 
Um, and reverse Trendelenburg, I alluded to that earlier. So for patients that have a lot of girth in their abdomen, um, you know, it, it, you think about what happens. A lot of girth there is pushing up the diaphragm. If you can put them in, not Trendelenburg, not head down, but reverse Trendelenburg, head up, but kind of flat, uh, flattened position that way, you can offload some of that, that belly. Uh, rotating beds uh, can be good as well, not just for the lungs, but also for uh, bed sores and the like. Uh, boutique modes of ventilation, if you give me a little latitude there, um, you know, well, some would argue that airway pressure release ventilation is not boutique. Um, but, you know, there's various opinions on that. Um, the, the key with, with APRV or airway pressure release ventilation is you have to have a critical, uh, a, a critical mass of clinicians who understand not just how to set it up initially with your T high, you know, P high, T, you know, uh, P low, T, not just with that stuff. And the, basically the drop and stretch strategy to head towards, you know, PEEP with pressure support, uh, but also how to manage it and try to normalize um, arterial blood gas results. Um, so it's lost some of its luster. Um, I tend to be a kind of a fan, more of a fan than not. But again, you have to have a critical mass of, of uh, you know, of staff that know how to use it. Oscillatory ventilation, no longer recommended in adults. So really, since, since the same time, since about 2016, you know, the, the research in respiratory and pulmonary medicine kind of had a growth spurt in the, you know, 2015, 16, 17. And, you know, it was discovered that oscillatory ventilation did not offer an advantage. Uh, inhaled nitric oxide uh, or inhaled um, pulmonary vasodilators, nitric oxide being one of them, uh, Flolon or, you know, prostacycline being another. Um, so prostacycline is an inhaled medication, an analog or cousin to Viagra, believe it or not. Um, inhaled nitric oxide has been around for a whole heck of a long time. They accomplish a similar thing in a very, in a different manner. Let me just say that much. Uh, extubation to adjunctive devices and early mobility are also in our toolbox. Let's take a, you know, a deeper dive, not an exhaustive dive, but a deeper dive into some of those factors we just mentioned. So weaning and liberation, predictors of successful weaning, you have Rich Clay and others in 2018, they did a Cochrane systematic review. That means they combined the results of all these well done studies and basically said, you know, spontaneous breathing trials, SBTs, combined with conservative sedation practices were associated with both reduced ventilator days and a, a lower length of stay in the ICU. Burns and others, 2014, basically an automated weaning. So the smart care where, where the, the automated weaning, you know, it can, can significantly decrease weaning time. Um, and, you know, things like vent days and ICU stay. The catch is this, the catch is that it can also, um, you know, in, in the United States, the FDA basically said the vent changes need to be done by a human being, by, by a licensed, you know, practitioner, respiratory therapist, nurse, doctor, um, but just can't be made o o automatedly. Um, that's, that's sort of a, um, a different, there's a different scenario in other developed countries where, you know, in, in some European countries where some of those changes are being made. Uh, that's an area where artificial intelligence will undoubtedly make it, make an impact, not tomorrow, but also not 20 years from now, probably in the next, you know, three or four, three, four, five years. But, uh, but uh, Tilia and others systematic review that uh, the RSBI, Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, was the most frequently, the most frequently studied, um, you know, uh, indicator and was an important tool in liberating patients. And then um, this uh, Kutschak piece in 2017 for head injury, head trauma, head bleed patients, um, the ability to follow commands or lack thereof uh, independently was a, a decent indicator of uh, extubation failure or success in these neurologic patients. So starting to like bundle some of these things together, optimizing, that may not be the, it's in quotes for a reason, because patients in probably in the IC or to step down. Okay, so optimizing, they're not, they're not optimized, you know, uh, of the, from their baseline, but optimizing them to facilitate weaning. How can we give them the best chance to succeed? So making sure that we're assessing them at least once a day for spontaneous breathing trial, spontaneous awakening trial. Sedation, lighten and consider switching to a kinder form of sedation such as Presidex, which tends to preserve the respiratory drive. Uh, adequate fluid balance is really important. Nutrition, so we kind of knew this all along, but now we really kind of know that if a patient is malnourished from a macro and a micronutrient perspective, they are, they're, they're, gonna, they're not gonna thrive. They're not gonna you know, wean as successfully. 
permit adequate recovery time from prior failed weaning attempts. So when patients develop diaphragmatic fatigue, often it takes them a minimum of 24 hours uh, to rest on assist control to recover, uh, sometimes more than 24 hours. And then the adjunctive respiratory care, bronchodilators, bronchial hygiene, suctioning, maintaining them, et cetera. Uh, airway optimization using you know, mucus shavers or scraper devices, as so endoclear is one example, but it's not the only example. Uh, adequate staffing resources, which is a challenge today. You know, you just, if, you, if you have 12 vents versus eight vents, you're probably not gonna be able to wean those 12 vents you know, as successfully as if you had a more manageable number. So it's a, it's a challenge, there's no right answer for that, but it is, it's also a factor that comes into play. Prone positioning, there was this abundance of evidence that came out again, 2016, 2017, it basically said, you know, uh, prone positioning is highly recommended for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Again, it was a systematic review, a meta-analysis, took, took a look at a lot of studies that were done. Prone positioning is likely to reduce mortality among patients with severe ARDS when applied for at least 12 hours a day. We, we actually had a proning protocol in place about two years before uh, COVID-19 really sunk its teeth into us. Um, and we did because our intensivists are up on this stuff. Um, you know, do it early, as I said, within the first 48 hours after ARDS. Uh, be aware that, you know, that, that you should have a protocol in place and that ET tube dislodgement is a risk. Um, the other thing is patients can, um, can disqualify themselves if they're deemed at high risk for coding. Because if a patient's prone and they code, they need to be flipped back. And some patients that are prone are not, you know, are not, you know, 100 pounds. So they're they're big people. So you know, when you, you don't do compressions on the back, you got to flip them back over. You got to put leads on them. You got to start compressions. You know, even if you use a Lucas device, whatever the case may be. So there's some caveats to it. But when those issues are addressed appropriately, proning is a very very powerful tool. We did proning. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, but we only used to prone for like six, eight hours. These studies basically say you got to do it, you know, as tolerated for at least 12 hours. Some of our, our COVID patients, we did it for like 18, 20 hours if they tolerated it. I'm not going to say too much about this slide because I've already said something about, about oscillatory ventilation, but these two studies, you know, one of them was a study of studies, uh, you know, Cochrane database, this piece by Sud in 2016, basically said, you know, high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation does not reduce hospital does not reduce hospital and 30-day mortality due to ARDS in adult patients, in adult patients. The oscillator is still very much a um, in the arsenal. The A uh, is very much in, in, in the arsenal for ventilating uh, uh, you know, neonates, very much so. APRV is kind of a mixed bag. You know, so strong evidence to support this JNP systematic review. Multiple studies demonstrated that APRV stabilized the alveoli, reduces the incidence of ARDS. Okay, so that was one study, 2016. Another study, 2016. APRV is not recommended as primary mode for COPD patients, but in resistant cases, it may be helpful. So kind of like, eh, wishy-washy, right? Weak support. And then you had, um, you had Eduardo uh, Morales at the Cleveland Clinic and Bob Kaczmarek, God rest his soul, up in Harvard, uh, basically given ex expert opinion, saying that they really, you know, it, you know, for APRV to be, you know, primary mode, it will require development of sound protocols. We need to do a lot more work. I will tell you that our medical director um, at the hospital where I still work at in acute care, he, uh, you know, was a fan at one point in time and then has, uh, I'm going to say, increasingly become a non-fan, <laughs> you know, that's not an oxymoron, but he's much less of a fan. And a lot of, a lot of it is, not that he doesn't believe in it, it's just it's going to be complex. And you have to have, again, your entire team understanding how to actually use it appropriately. Your pulmonary vasodilators, again, inhaled uh, nitric oxide. You know, you have, um, you know, you, you know the, the, the usual things that you kind of know about flow line, the syringe pump, et cetera, et cetera, dry side. Um, but it's just some th considerations. With inhaled nitric oxide, you know, it's all front loaded. Once you set it up, it's pretty much, you know, running. With inhaled uh, epropostanol, it's not necessarily automatic. You need to change filters. You need to change your syringes. You need to monitor. You monitor your patient in both cases, but one of them is kind of, it's a much cheaper drug. It being, Flowline is a much cheaper drug than inhaled nitric oxide, but you got to look at the all-in costs. And we really didn't use much 
of uh, you know much flow line during covid because it required you to go in the room more to change filters and, and syringes whereas held nitric oxide it was once it was set up it was less labor intensive you know you got to maybe titrate it down you got to change the tank you know whatever but just much less uh, labor intensive but the evidence overall on the on the use of these medications you're not solving the problem um, but you're you're buying time for the patient um, helping equilibrate, you know, you're addressing the VQ, you're addressing the Q, the blood flow, um, but you're buying them time so that their, their lungs can begin to heal and they can begin to re recover overall. Another tool in the arsenal is looking at extubating high-risk patients to adjunctive devices. So high flow, you know, extubating to high-flow nasal cannula, more often when it's more of an oxygenation issue where the patient's you know they're not they're marginal okay but but they're headed for a trach so high flow nasal cannula is a, uh, a reliable alternative to non-invasive reduced rate of intubation compared to conventional oxygen therapy so mainly if it's again hypoxemic respiratory failure and then this other study in 2017 also basically said it reduced the the risk for reintubation um, when patients were extubated to high flow not limitlessly okay because then you'd run out of high flows but where these patients are you know, again, kind of marginal. Non-invasive, this is a, a zoo piece uh, that came out in 2013, where non-invasive can reduce the need for reintubation, improve clinical outcomes as compared to invasive ventilation. So bottom line is this, it should, you know, it, it should be on your, uh, you know, kind of in reserve, okay? What we do sometimes is sometimes we'll excavate right to the device. Sometimes we'll actually have it right outside the room, the patient looks like they're not doing well, you know, initially we'll connect them to it. But the studies basically say, don't wait too long, okay? That if you wait too long, the patient's starting to tuck around and then you put them on the high floor and the non-invasive, you probably waited too long. So yeah, you can wait like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but don't wait like hours and hours and they're kind of like starting to decompensate, you know, gradually um, get them going on that and it may be a good bridge for them. Early mobility, so early, the whole, premise of early mobility is, you know, sitting is better than laying. Even sitting up in bed is better than laying down. Sitting on the edge of the bed, as long as you're safe, you know, the patient's monitored, dangling your feet, again, safely, um, or feet on the ground is better than, you know, sitting in bed. Standing is better than sitting. Walking even a few steps is better than just standing, etc. And there's a lot of decent evidence to support you know, um, you know the, the appropriate use of early mobility. So a lot, this would be done a lot more. It's even being done with patients that are mechanically ventilated. The problem with that is it's very labor intensive. So, you know, you have to have, you know, therapist, nurse, you know, nursing assistant, whatever, um, who's available to actually, you know, ambulate the patient. So now let's take a look at the, let's take a look at some cases here. So a physician orders intubation and volume control ventilation for a six foot three tall, tall drink of water, 190 pound, 86 kg adult male with ARDS. Which of the following ventilator settings would you aim to support this patient? Okay. So, you know, again, they're, they're telling you, you know, I, I write questions for the National Board for Respiratory Care. Don't, don't hate me for it, but I, I do. When the MBRC, if this was an MBRC question, they, they pose the patients, you know, 86 kgs. If they don't say, you know, if they don't qualify it in some way, you would assert that this is the, near their ideal or predicted body weight. Okay, so let's say they're in that, you know, 85 to 90 kg range. You can look at, you know, tidal volume of 800 is real close to about, you know, 9 point something, you know, mLs per kg. 1200 is just too much. 900 is also pushing the flight envelope. Okay, and you're looking at, you know, a, a, an answer like 500. Okay may actually be a fairly realistic scenario, okay? And that is, in fact, the answer in this case, that 500 for this individual is gonna be about six mLs per kg, not a terrible starting place, but of course you'd wanna, you know, modify it depending upon uh, plateau pressures, driving pressures, ABG results, and overall clinical assessment. A little bit of the feedback here just goes on and on to describe that, you know, pretty much what I said, six mLs per kg, almost right on the button, you know, as long as your plateau pressures are good there. And they're saying, well, what, what would you do? You could go as low for plateau pressures that are north of 30, you could go as low as four mLs per kg. And then we talk a little bit about permissive hypercapnia that you may tolerate, you know, in those lower tidal volumes, you may tolerate a little bit of acidosis 
for a while as long as the kidneys can retain um, you know, bicarb and buffer the, uh, the effect over time. Case, in this particular case, case two, you note the medical record of a patient who is receiving volume control ventilation, plateau pressure has been increased in the last six hours, while the, the PIP, the peak inspiratory pressure levels remain constant. Which of the following is most likely cause? Development of pulmonary edema, water accumulation in the tubing, partial obstruction in the, in the tracheal tube, development of bronchospasm. Okay, so really, look, pulmonary edema could affect compliance. Okay, water accumulation is going to have other effects, maybe give you the Bart Simpson, you know, haircut thing. Partial obstruction of the endotracheal tube is going to again be more peak airway pressure, not plateau. Development of bronchospasm, likewise. So best answer is, drum roll, A, development of pulmonary edema. And a little bit of the, you know, you're almost doing answering this one by saying, well, you know, there's other things that can affect compliance. But clearly, clearly, the top, the, the B, C, and D um, do not um, do not fit that criteria. And that's pretty much what the, um, you know, what the, the description is going on to say here. 36-year-old woman just undergone, undergone intestinal bypass surgery is brought to the recovery room uh, is intubated. She has no pulmonary function, weighs 136 pounds, you know, kgs, 300 pounds. So that tells you a lot. She's, she's a, a big woman. Um, uh, and it is, uh, she's 5 foot 2 inches tall. So she's 5'2", but she weighs 300 pounds. So she's probably got a BMI of like 45 or 50, so a, a big number, okay? So they're really pointing you to saying, well, what would her predicted body weight be? You could do the math, but I'm going to tell you right now, her predicted body weight is probably around, you know, 55 or 60 60 kg, something along those lines. So that's really what, where they're taking you down that pathway. That probably realistically, you know, if she's 60 kgs, you can kind of say if you're doing six, that her her you know tidal volume, her her you know uh, uh, um, targeted tidal volume would be something along 500, okay, which which would be in the range of about you know six to eight mLs per kg. The explanation is just going on to sp specify exactly that. That this actual you know patient's weight should not not be used to establish initial tidal volume. Rather, you know, her initial tidal volume should be using the formula of you know six to ten pre of predicted body weight, uh, which is you know probably about you know fifty in that fifty to sixty kg range. Also recommended that the initial respiratory rate be set between like ten and sixteen, something along those lines. Doctor uh, institutes volume control ventilation for a patient who's um, 80 kilograms. Again, then it'll give you a height, so you can assert that that's probably near their predicted body weight. Which of the following is the maximum pressure that you would aim to achieve with this patient? Okay, so a uh, uh, peak pressure of 50, that's kind of a high number. Plateau pressure of 30, hmm, let's see what the other answers are. Peak pressure of 40 and a plateau pressure of 50. So this is really going back to ARDSnet, totally going back to ARDSnet. The best answer is B. So you're again thinking of that equal to or less than 30. And you say, well, I like 25 better. Well, 25 is not a choice. So let's see what the ex explanation says a little bit a little bit more here. So according to, again, the National Institutes of Health protocol, so ARDSnet, um, four to six mLs per kg is what's targeted with a maximum plateau pressure of 30 centimeters of water. Ventilator rate should be initially set to match the prior minute ventilation, but can be increased as needed up to a maximum of 35. In addition, in addition, slightly hypercapnic state, so 7.25 to 7.35, and a PCO2 slightly higher than average, you know, or recommended 45 to 50, is known as permissive hypercapnia, okay? May be tolerated in order to maintain lower tidal volume to keep your plateau pressures, basically to be able to deliver your minute ventilation in a kinder and gentler manner. So this particular one, they're really taking you down the pathway. You observe the following pressure volume loop display on a patient receiving volume control ventilation. What I don't like is the beak. I'm going right to the beak. I don't, I don't, I don't like beaks. I like birds, but not, not, not this beak thing. Which of the following actions would be appropriate? A, decreased the delivered volume. Hmm, I, I like that one. Let's see what else. Increase the inspiratory flow. If anything, that's going to in, increase your peak area pressure. Uh, decrease the IE ratio. Often we don't do that directly. Okay, we can control that by either eye time or inspiratory flow. Uh, in, increase the PEEP levels. Increase the PEEP levels. Okay, 
biggest, just looking at this from a distance, the biggest issue is the beak, is the beak. Correct answer is decrease the delivered volume. Don't like a that beak. This pressure volume uh, loop exhibits significant flattening beyond its upper inflection point, indicating over distension of the lungs. Due to the its resemblance to the bird beak, sometimes called a beaked um, pressure volume curve or loop. You, uh, when you observe this, generally you want to resolve it, reducing the, the tidal volume and volume ventilation or the delta P if it's pressure control ventilation. So let's look at case number six. Patient under your care has x-ray and clinical evidence of severe unilateral right lung infiltrate. His PO2 on a non-rebreather mask is 55. It keeps him alive, but not happy with it because your you know, PDF ratio is crap -out. The uh, attending physician asks your advice on how best to improve this patient's oxygenation without committing to ventilatory support. Which of the following would you recommend? A, place the patient on the left side down. Remember we talked about earlier, left side down. B, place the patient on the right side, okay, on his right side. Remember, the right lung is the bad lung, okay? And I'm going to take you down the pathway in the interest of time and say, we, in general, in general, want good lung down. Turn the patient from supine to prone, okay? Interesting, it kind of like make you scratch your head there, but this is unilateral lung disease. So they're telling you that for a reason. Institute a regimen of inspiratory resistive breathing. That's just a distractor is what we call from the standpoint of the MBRC. A, place the patient with the good, with the, if you will, good lung down, good lung down. And a little more elaboration on this as well, depending on positioning, you know, basically can um, improve the distribution of ventilation in the patients with VQ imbalances, especially those with local conditions such as unilateral pneumonias or consolidation. Placing the good lung in the dependent or, or down position, left lung, can significantly improve oxygenation without a change in FiO2 since the down lung will receive the best ventilation and blood flow. Another plausible option is to initiate high flow nasal cannula therapy. However, um, this is not a choice in this particular case. All right, folks, let's, let's you know, take a closer look here where more work is, need, is needed to be done. So to dedicate appropriate resources, staffing, supplies, equipment, vent patient management and weaning is resource intensive. There's no question about it. Because it's not just weaning, it's if they're weaning well, you wanna get, get the tube out and you don't want them pulling their own tube out for a whole lot of reasons. Not good for them, but it's also you're gonna have to do all that paperwork. You know, they pulled a, you know, a cuff through their vocal cords and the vocal cords may look like tendons, they're not, it's fragile uh, tissue. Spontaneous breathing trials, again, doing them daily, uh, prone positioning, nitric oxide can all be useful, hence, Vent patient management depends on appropriate staffing and other resources, uh, as well as su supportive and informed leadership. Other supportive practices may not be practical. Early mobility for mechanically ventilated patients show, show great promise, but you have to have the appropriate resources, the staff to actually do it. Other boutique uh, ventilator modes, such as the VDR, I'm not anti-VDR, again, you just have to make sure you have um, appropriate staff that know how to use it. And in some cases, the VDR, when it was used on some COVID patients, the outcomes were not, were not that great. So if, when, in, when in competent hands, it could be very, um, very useful. Um, when not, yeah, not so much. We talked a lot about airway pressure release ventilation as well, where it requires extensive training and if you will, education and re-education as well. And ARDSnet did not work especially well in COVID-19 induced ARDS. A lot of that's a mystery. Um, we're not, even the experts are not really sure they've kind of studied it. But when you think about, you know, the, the mortality rate in this country, once a patient was intubated was about 40% for your, your most severely uh, uh, afflicted uh, COVID-19 patients who were in respiratory failure. They weren't intubated, because of a car accident and then they tested positive. That's not respiratory failure. That's, that's because they needed maybe needed orthopedic surgery, whatever the case may be, uh, or repeated surgeries. These are patients that are in, a, a truly in respiratory failure secondary to COVID-19, about a 40% mortality rate. And you know it was what it was type of deal. Uh, in some countries, by the way, it was much higher than that. 
Okay, Italy and Spain, when they had their first, you know, influx, it was well, well over 50%. It's like, it's like 60, 65, 70% or higher mortality rates. Um, there's also concerns with inconsistencies in practice. Use of high-flow nasal cannula and non-invasive to avoid intubation and reintubation. Okay, so patients that are post-op that have otherwise healthy lungs should not, probably not, be extubated to non-invasive or to high-flow nasal cannula. Because if you did that and you had an active, you know, uh, surgery uh, program, you might not have any high flows left for the patients that really need them. Okay, but it's something to kind of, you know, be be mindful of that where appropriate protocols can go a long way here. Interprescriber variation, so variation in physician practice can also be an issue, where you have you know physicians that want to start metineb on every on every post-op patient, um, and some of them simply don't need it or would find it you know uh, um, obtrusive, if you will. Um, so these these you know these consi consistencies and inconsistencies have always been a problem, but they really need to be kept to an absolute minimum. So coming down the home stretch, so there's been many advances. Um, in, in, you know, ARDS and managing these patients, but they're complex. And mechanical ventilation is complex. It's helped elevate our profession. That's the good news. But again, it also means that the skill level needs to be elevated. A lot of respiratory programs are still at the associate's degree level. I, I, I have a faculty appointment at, 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 a, at a community college. I'm a product of a community college. I'm not anti. It's just very difficult to cover all the content that you need to in such a short uh, span of time. So there's those issues. And you spit out students, even if they pass the credentialing exams, you know, it's it's hard. They it, it's harder for them to hit the ground running. Mechanical ventilation saves lives, but can also be harmful. The, the whole thing where we started, you know, with, with them being death machines or so, you know, tongue in cheek called that. An abundance of research and resulting protocols has helped guide safer and more effective practice. However, however, the research is, is constantly changing, and um, so we must absolutely positively keep abreast of that as well. So I want to uh, leave you with some, um, you know, some articles that you may or may not find interesting. Um, you know, among them is Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care, where we have uh, Bob Kaczmarek still has, uh, you know, again, he's passed away, but his, his, um, his chapters are still very um, omnipotent in, in that. And now we have uh, Rob Chatburn and uh, some others that have taken the reins on some of those mechanical ventilation chapters. And there's five chapters that are dedicated to critical care assessment and, you know, initiating, maintaining, and, you know, liberating patients from mechanical ventilation. Some very good content that's there as well. Um, also, you know, I would, I would send you to that, the Brower, Matei, Mars piece. That's the original piece that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But it's interesting. That piece is interesting, not just from an ARDSNET perspective, but it's also interesting because it speaks to um, a, a study where they, they actually, you know, they didn't halt the study, but they had to take the patients who were on the higher tidal volume, the 12 mLs per kg, and they had to cross them over and reduce their tidal volume for ethical reasons. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon that, that's there as well. You know, with that, I want to, um, I want to just conclude by um, thanking you guys uh, for joining us today. You know, Terry and I and our, our guest lecturers are always appreciative um, that you've taken time to, you know, out of your day to, to join us. Um, and I, we know that you need to earn CEUs, you know, for licensure, maybe for employment as well, you know, that sort of thing. But hopefully you got something out of this uh, presentation. And probably most importantly is Terry and I hope that you come back to us, that you spread the word. If you think that, you know, this and the other lectures that we offer were, you know, were good, um, that you spread the word and that you, um, you know, you, and, you, and you come back to us and have some of your colleagues join us as, as well. With that, I want to uh, conclude this presentation. I want to thank you very much, and I you know, hope you come back to us, and I want to wish you a, uh, an excellent rest of your day. Take care. Last concluding thought is if you do have any questions, feel free to um, email Terry or I, and we'd be happy to get back, uh, you know, get back to you um, on any questions that you may have. Again, thanks a lot. Glad you joined us. Have a wonderful day.